This next session is about tipping points. As most of you know, our climate is dangerously close to points of no return, moments when nothing might ever be the same again. Once certain thresholds or tipping points are crossed, chain reactions caused by an accumulation of small changes will shift our climate irrevocably. But what exactly are these tipping points? And if they occur over decades or centuries, could we cross them without even noticing? What are the extreme risks that they are already perpetuating? And how can we avoid the worst impacts? Those are the questions that we will be discussing um, with two of stalwarts of research uh, on this field, uh, people that we at the New York Times reach out to for knowledge, for comment on these issues. Um, Dr. Johan Rockström, who's uh, director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and Dr. Hui Sung Lee, uh, who's the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, we'll also be joined by my colleague, Ray Jong in New York, who is the New York Times' in-house specialist on climate science. So with that, um, I will invite our speakers up to the stage so we can begin our discussion. We often think of climate change as linear. We add a certain amount of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and aspects of the Earth's chemistry respond in a certain way by a certain amount. It becomes hotter by a certain amount. Storms contain more water by a certain amount. Snow and ice melt by a certain amount. These aren't changes we want to see, but at least we have a decent grasp on the magnitudes of cause and effect. Tipping points are very much not linear. Once we cross them, even by a little bit, big changes can happen abruptly and irreversibly. They gather speed on their own. Coral reefs dying en masse, ice sheets collapsing, not just melting little by little. Huge ocean currents getting thrown off course. Once we cross the tipping point, what seems like just another little increment of global warming sets off a sequence of events, one that stays in motion even after we reverse that little last increment of warming. Changes in the climate start to run away from our ability to do much about them. <coughs> Scientists like Dr. Lee and Dr. Rockstrom have, Rockstrom have been thinking about these tipping points for a long time. How far away are they? How catastrophic could they be? Which climate events even have tipping points? And how might different tipping elements interact, one tipping the other, tipping another? There's been a lot of interesting work on all these questions, and scientists are gaining confidence in their predictions, reducing their uncertainties. I just wanted to highlight a few recent findings. Some of it, I think, is, is good news, at least in the scheme of things. Um, scientists have become more confident that certain changes aren't irreversible or self-perpetuating. Arctic sea ice can reform to some extent. Areas of permafrost can refreeze, although of course the carbon that's released when it thaws doesn't go back into the earth. Uh, for other events, the tipping point seems slightly farther out in the future than was once believed. These would be, for instance, the die off of boreal forests or a, a shutdown of ocean mixing in the North Atlantic. And other climate patterns that scientists once thought might shift abruptly after a certain point now don't really seem to have a clear tipping point. A collapse in the Indian monsoon, for instance, or a more persistent El Nino. Those can just keep shifting and shifting gradually, which may not actually be very good news. Of course, that still leaves us with several really high impact events that could begin on a dime and cause damage that scientists believe will be irreversible for centuries, even millennia. And some of these, like the loss of the West Arctic ice sheet, might already have begun. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Max, and hope you have a good discussion. Thanks, Ray. Um, I think something that Ray just did for us there was, you know, in addition to kind of walking us through what we do and don't know, is, is introduce us to how, that there are many tipping points, not just one. Um, and... And so on that note, I'm, I'm, I think I wanted to start with you, Jan, um, about how we should understand this science. You know, is, um, 
is kind of addressing and avoiding these tipping points more about uh, the kind of goals that we hear so much about at COP, which is about limiting global average temperatures uh, to a certain amount of rise or, or not? Or are there targeted approaches, um, you know, depending on what tipping point we're talking about? Um, or is it some kind of mix of those two things? Mm. Yeah, thanks, uh, Max. And, and, and let me just uh, kind of follow on on Ray's really good summary here to, to come to your answer. So to begin with, what, what is, uh, why are we talking about tipping points? Well, it's that we push so-called tipping elements across their biophysical thresholds, which leads exactly as Max says, to shifts in feedbacks, which means irreversible change. And what we uh, mean by a tipping element is a biophysical system that fulfills two criteria. Criteria number one is that we have scientific evidence that it contributes to regulate the state of the climate system. And the second criteria is that we have scientific evidence that they have multiple stable states. So it can be either a frozen ice sheet or a liquefied ice sheet, or a rainforest or a savanna. And what separates these states are the interactions and feedbacks. So these are non-negotiable biological, chemical, physical properties of these systems. So if you have a healthy ice sheet with very high altitude, it's very cold. If that starts melting and it gets lower and lower altitude, you get a self-amplifying feedback because the lower the altitude, the warmer it gets. The darker the surface gets because it gets liquefied and albedo shifts. And at a very precise point, it goes from self-cooling to self-warming. So in all tipping point research, we're always looking for these two criteria. Does it control the climate system? And does it have multiple stable states with feedback dynamics? That's why as Max says, as, as Ray says, there's been a lot of science here, even, even um, excluding some systems that we thought were tipping elements, but that actually don't show this behavior, like the monsoon systems, like Arctic sea ice. But now we've come a long way. The first tipping point science was published in 2008. We've do, done several updates, and in 2029 we had the final update, and the last one came just six weeks ago, where we, for the first time, did a full scrutiny and coming up with the analysis that we have 16 of these tipping element systems that fulfill the two criteria and, and assessing these very carefully in terms of their temperature thresholds. They align, by the way, very well with, uh, with the IPCC6 assessment that in table 4.10 in working group 1 has the first time the table of the tipping element systems but not providing temperature thresholds on them. We do the first attempt of scientifically putting temperature thresholds showing, just like Ray says, that a number of them are at risk already today. Actually, at 1.5 degrees Celsius, the Green Ice Sheet, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, tropical coral reef systems, and abrupt thawing of boreal permafrost are likely, likely to cross the threshold. That's a very strong scientific statement. But then, for example, the Amazon rainforest, to come to your, your point about, about your multiple interactions, here. Here, here the Amazon there. rainforest we assessed okay. in terms of temperature is Thanks at so risk much. at beyond 2 degrees Thank Celsius. You. So a bit of a positive message there, more resilient than we had thought. But then when we discuss this with the ecological scientists, they tell us, you know what, you have to factor in deforestation as well. Because the ecological undermining of the resilience may pull down that temperature threshold even further. So Carlos Nobres, leading Brazilian scientist who is here at COP, he says that already a 20% deforestation combined with 1.5 could push us across the tipping point. But the science is still unclear there. So yes, it's complex, it's about interactions between bio biology and physics, but I think we've coming, made major advancements to get much better precision on, on when, when are we at risk, and we're approaching that risk very soon. Oh, Dr. Lee, I wonder if you can help us understand what role the IPCC plays in, in studying these phenomena, and, and before this we were talking about you know, what's known and what's not known, and, and I'm wondering if you could talk more about that too. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting the IPCC uh, in, this, uh, in this forum. Uh, before I answer to uh, your question specifically, uh, just uh, give you some of my understanding of the tipping points uh, from an uh, uh, economist and uh, from that point. Uh, this morning, I was, uh, when I was eating breakfast, I saw outside, there was a, outside a, a pool and the pool was equipped with a, a water slide. 
So there's a stairs going up to the top, and then uh, some plateau, and then water slide. The kids were enjoying uh, that water slide. And I saw that this sort of configuration was very much looking like a net zero emissions pathway. But at the same time, the kids were enjoying jumping from that board and then down slide. And that looks like a perfect example of passing the tipping point. Once you pass that point, there's no turning back. Only way is going down to the water pool. And the kid knows where is that tipping point. I, I thought that we do not know where the tipping points for these climate events. And the scientists, as Johan explained, scientists are working very hard to narrow the uncertainties about where and how serious these tipping points are. The IPCC does, is a, uh, a platform uh, to uh, engage a uh, scientist, physical scientist, as well as e ecology and also science, uh, social science, e economics, and other uh, relevant disciplines uh, to uh, answer these critical questions of uh, climate systems, changes in the climate systems, and its impact on human and natural systems and the ways to uh, respond uh, for a livable future. And uh, we have just finished the uh, three uh, working group reports and the synthesis report that uh, will be available uh, next year. Well, maybe we can bring that back to you then, um, Johan. The, I kind of want to come back to the idea of there being targeted approaches, even if there is some uncertainty about exactly what constitutes a tipping point and, and when we're close to hitting it and what contributes to it, it seems that even in that process, there must be some discussion of what are the best mitigating tools. Um, and some of those may differ depending on the many different scenarios that you laid out. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. And, um, and, and I, I should just add one element before coming to exactly what those tools are and what approach I would advise us to take. Because it's, it's just like Hoi Song Lee says, I mean, we're doing so much effort in advancing the research on tipping points, but they're complex. And not only are they complex in, in their own individual analysis, they also interact between, among the tipping points themselves. And, and Ray pointed that out, that we have cascades between tipping element systems. So, for example, what we are now showing is that when the Greenland ice sheet, which is one tipping element system, melts very fast, it releases cold fresh water into the North Atlantic. This slows down another tipping element, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which has slowed down by 15%. It's a thermodynamic engine, which is driven by really heavy saline water that flows from the Southern Ocean at the surface, releases heat up in the Gulf Stream, and then sinks to the bottom and flows back and it circulates in the North Atlantic. But with fresh water, it dilutes the weight, the density goes down, the engine slows down, and the whole overturning slows down. That pushes the monsoon system further to the south, impacting on another tipping element system, the Amazon. The Amazon basin gets less rainfall, more droughts, more fire, releases carbon, and comes closest to its tipping point but it also locks surface water, heavy saline surface water in the Southern Ocean, which can explain why the West Antarctic ice sheet, another tipping element, is melting faster than science had predicted. These cascades is at the scientific frontier, not yet reported in the IPCC. But what does this mean for your question? Well, in my mind, it must imply precautionary principle because science will never get the exact, I mean, it's, it's like the kids on the slide. There's an exact point. We know it. It's just like our body temperature is also a tipping point. You know, we know that at 42 degrees Celsius, we tip over from one very desired state, living, to another not very good state, die. And, and that's a, it's trial and error that has taken us to that point. But do we ever act on the 42 degrees Celsius? Of course we don't. If anyone in this room approaches 39, we go home and go to bed. That's precaution. We've learned that trial and error. And that is what I think we should apply also for the tipping point system. So tipping point science 
is actually the most important scientific guide for the planetary boundary research. When we quantify the planetary boundaries, we use tipping point science to help us place the boundary, the safe boundary. So safe boundary on land and water and carbon are guided by tipping point science. We have uncertainty ranges, the confidence intervals, that we've learned from the IPCC, by the way, the red embers diagrams, and these help us to define the, the safe position. And, and I always argue that we should place that at the lower end of the scientific confidence range, because that's the precautionary prone. Go beyond that point, and we enter this slippery danger zone where things can happen, but we cannot get the exact number. <clears throat> Those kind of cascading effects that Dr. Rockstrom is describing seem to be, to me at least, kind of one of the most crystal clear explanations of the urgency of all these talks around climate change. Um, you know, our systems are interconnected and understanding that more scientifically is, is the key to acting on them. And so, Dr. Lee, I'm, I'm wondering kind of with the IPCC providing such a, a basis for understanding and ultimately for others to act, whether those are scientists or governments, what is the, what is the kind of future of, of research on tipping points that, that the IPCC is undertaking? You know, uh, the theme for this uh, COP is COP for implementation. And uh, I think there's a very uh, substantive meaning to that. And then I remember that this isn't the first time, first COP that used word implementation as a main theme. And uh, 2017, we had a Fiji bond cup. At that time, the theme was the momentum for implementation. And 2017, uh, that was the uh, year uh, that I, one year before the special report on 1.5 made available. And after that, the IPCC report 1.5 and the special report on the land, the special report on the oceans and cryosphere, and then three regular uh, reports. That regular report was completed in 2022. So I counted that from 17, 2017 to 2022, so five years, and uh, it took, what, six IPCC reports to drop that word momentum <laughs> from the implementation. So I wonder, you know, does probably the IPCC will do the, uh, these assessments, regular plus some special reports within the next five years, and then after five years, what will be the theme for the COP? And hopefully, we hope that it will be the theme, a COP for celebration, hopefully. Celebration for what? Celebration, the global peaking of emissions indeed occurred before that year. That will be marvelous. And I think that this tipping point uh, certainly should start from our understanding of the natural system. But I also want to say that there, is a, there should be a tipping point in the social system. And in this report, AR6 Working Group 3, can I be specific, uh, report, clear indication that there are tipping points that in the society, so that once that critical point passed, then we, society as a whole, uh, will go for a certain uh, direction. And uh, I mentioned about this water slide, and I believe that, the, that if we invest correctly, correctly means that uh, investing in the lower carbon uh, assets, and then it will create some kind of a de path dependency. Uh, therefore, society as a whole will slide down to the net zero. Now, to have that tipping point, we must have, for the world as a whole, a peaking of global emissions as soon as possible. And uh, as you know very well, right now, the emissions is increasing. And uh, so, let's wait. When, uh, let's see when that global peaking will happen. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that such peaking uh, will uh, come to us as early as possible. 
Well, thank you for, <clears throat> for bringing us to the idea of a social tipping point. Um, that was going to be my last question before we throw it out to the audience for, for theirs. Um, do, do you think, Johan, that the urgency of this is, is conveyed well enough in, in the media or even within the scientific community? And, and at what point do we see a, a social tipping point where perhaps there's some kind of realization that of an impending feedback loop that can't be reversed, where that idea takes hold, not just in an individual's mind, but in a society's collective sense of purpose. Well, I, and, and the following, I, I really don't say, because we're sitting in a New York Times event, but, but I would really congratulate New York Times. If, if every citizen in the world read the New York Times, they would be very much on top of the fact that we are in the midst of a climate crisis. Or you could read The Guardian, or you could read The Wall Street Journal even, or you could read uh, you know, Washington Post, you can read so many of the, of the mainstream media. The problem is that we're still not reaching out to all the aisles politically or, or citizen-wise across the world. So that is a continued challenge, but I would say that the scientific community is today, I mean, in my professional career, I've, I've never felt that there's been such a strong momentum and consensus. There's never consensus in science, but the message is really clear. We're, we're, we're facing serious risks, and we need to, as, as Hoesung Lee points out, bend the global curve of emissions very fast. In fact, if you look carefully at the IPCC assessment from the 1.5 report, but already in the AR5, most scenarios that takes us to a safe landing well below 2 and can land at 1.5, they bend 2020, actually. So, so it's uh, every year now, puts us not only at risk for undermining and crossing tipping points, but also undermining in terms of rising climate extremes. But the budget shrinks so much that we are already today at the requirement of 5 to 7% emission reductions per year to have any chance of staying within the carbon budget. And, you know, we're increasing by 1% to 2% per year. And we know that, you know, if you go beyond 5%, you're talking about energy revolution pace. I mean, it's not easy to see how you can keep the economy running while at the same time do that pace of transition. So I would say that it's well understood today that it is an urgency, apart from those uh, stakeholders that still, most of them not being denialists, but most of them just sitting status quo on the fence and kind of hedging their bets still on, on where will this move over the next 10, 20 years. And I think what we need to do is to show that it's clearly moving in the direction of decarbonization. You don't want to left behind on that on that transition. Okay, I think we have time to pass around a mic for some questions. Um, is that right? Um, hi, uh, so my name is Walid Mansour. I'm from Egypt, and I have two questions, one for Professor Johan and one for Professor Lee. And my question to Professor Johan is, do you really believe it's a matter of finance to solve the climate crisis? So if the money is there, we know it is, is that the only problem we have? That's not a cynical question. And uh, my second question to you, Professor, is regarding, since you spoke of the social aspect, do you think that environmental reform can happen in absence of democratic institutions whereby scientists are free, journals are free, people can speak and complain? Thank you. You want to take them straight? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. So, so finance is really, really important, but I would argue that it's not the only question that needs to be resolved for a, for a transition, a fast transition. Uh, finance is important in several ways. I mean, one is that we must immediately stop the 500 billion US dollars per year of direct subsidies for fossil fuel use, or the five, four to five trillion US dollars in, in, in implicit or indirect subsidies. So that has to stop. And then we have to, and then we have to you know, get all the financial institutions from pension funds to asset managers to private banks to, to completely halt all financing of new fossil fuel infrastructure. I mean, from Norwegian oil exploration 
to new gas fields to coal-fired plants in China. That, that, that has to stop. So that is finance, really critical. And the third one is, of course, to put the investments and help developing countries to accelerate their decarbonization pathways, to help developing countries to, to, to be able to move away from often very cheap state-owned fossil fuel resources to be able to scale up renewable energy sources. But will all that be enough? I would argue that the answer is no, because we also need the innovation and the technologies, we need the social tipping points to occur so you get a much more equitable sharing of the remaining carbon space, how to do that when we're over-consuming carbon in the north and under-consuming in the south. So there are much, much more elements to it than only finance. Yes, I, I think I uh, probably uh, not uh, heard uh, well about your question. I, I understood that your question is about uh, what the society can do. <coughs> can the society can do to uh, resolve this uh, question? We don't have democratic agenda. All right, very good questions. Let me let me uh, emphasize this: the climate change issue, and uh, well, in fact, all other environmental issues, is the problem of how to deal with what is known as so-called externality. Uh, it is the area that market system uh, do not properly address, cannot properly address. Now. That means that government has to have a clear role in resolving these questions. Now, for climate change issues, uh, as, as you know very well, uh, it, is a, it requires a collective action. Collective means that all nations uh, in, in the world. And uh, we should not have such a thing as a free rider uh, in the mitigation effort. Now, it's, not easy, and uh, that's the reason why nations uh, meet regularly uh, to uh, have a uh, common solution, common action. Now, there are certain parts of the uh, segment of society uh, who does not really believe in the role of government. And, uh, you know, I don't question the, uh, uh, their uh, world view or their uh, philosophy of that uh, role, but Clearly, the science, and may I say that economic discipline indicates that there is a definite role for public sector, government, to play to resolve climate issues, to resolve environmental issues. And uh, without that leading role by the government, I don't think we will ever able to resolve these climate problems. The reason is very simple. Yongan mentioned very well about these investment questions. And you know, the biggest uncertainty in the, the investment decisions, also investment that we need to have in this climate stabilization, is uncertainty on the part of government. Policy uncertainty is the greatest uncertainty that the real world decision makers has to have. Now, I think that's a tragedy. Government is supposed to be a entity to give us the leading role in this solution of global public goods problems. So we keep trying, and uh, we need to have a, some sort of mechanism uh, that will give us a very clear link between the pursuit of global public good and the decision that will be made by us individually and locally so that every one of us makes decision on the basis of his or her best interest. But in the end, when it, when it was aggregated, we'll find a outcome that, is, that would be compatible with the achieving of that global public good. At this moment, we do not have that link. And uh, the reason governments meet so often is that to establish that link
between global, pursuing global public good and individual decision-making process. Hi, uh, my name is Samuel Rubin, and I'm a social impact producer and a climate storyteller. So I really appreciate that today's session started with a storytelling uh, moment. So my question to you and the scientific community is, how do we collaborate with cultural strategies, with storytellers, with communicators, to make sure that your scientific findings reach the general mainstream audience? And how do we do that? beyond the apocalypse, beyond despair, because unfortunately not a lot of people read reports that are hundreds of pages with a lot of scientific language. And I wonder if you feel that your work is actually uh, rich in, and the people are understanding how close we are to the tipping point. I actually had a similar question to that, and I'll kind of add my version if I hope you don't mind, um, which is, you know, maybe you can also, both of you could paint pictures for us of, of where we're going right now and, and maybe do a bit of your own storytelling in, in, in that sense. Um, I think, you know, I think that that'd be a great thing to leave people here with is, is a sense of, of what you think about actually, physically, when you think about tipping points. Well, let, let me just in a way, sum, summarize it partly to, to, it's not a defense uh, point, but I think it's quite important to recognize that science is science, and we're not the best communicators. But I don't think we should be expected to be the best communicators. I think we need to hold hands and work with the communicators. We need to help each other here. Uh, IPCC is just the most phenomenal institution the world has. I mean, it's just fantastic to have the scientific floor to stand on for all our policy making, for all our communication, for all our work. But IPCC cannot do it alone. I mean, IPCC has done tremendous improvements in communication. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the IPCC AR6 summary for all. It's just fantastic. I mean, I was really congratulate you for that. I mean, just read it through. It's, it's just a phenomenal way of just communicating to every citizen in the world what the IPCC assessment says. But painting the future, well, you know, there are two futures. One future is, of course, the dark future. It's a future where, in just 50 years' time, 3 billion people will live in regions that health-wise are so hot that the vulnerable people will be on the move, will have forced displacement. 1.6 billion already today live in such regions. So we are at risk of having you know, people's movement, food insecurity, displacement, social conflict, you know, just amplified droughts, floods, disease, storms, simply a world that is less and less livable for all humans. But if we act, and if we're able to bend the curve, but also come back within the planetary boundaries, we have just this sliver of a chance to have a future where we're not only able to maintain planet Earth at the state that we are in roughly as today, but also a future where we have so much evidence today that health-wise, security-wise, job-wise, life expectancy, but also in terms of jobs, economy, innovation, is a much more advanced, much more attractive, much more equitable. You can just think of the energy independence in most countries that do not sit in the hands of autocratic, warmongering dictators like Putin. It's quite a desirable future if you just amplify the pace to decarbonize. So that is, of course, what leads the youth movement today to the double frustration. We have the risks, but we also know that the future is brighter if we act. And that is a, a double frustration if we're not acting. So I think we, exactly as you say, Max, we need to paint more clearly the, um, the future in, in a way that can be visibly shown. But I think we need help there, to be honest. I don't think we as academics are the best place to do it. We, we can give the, the pieces to it, but we need help in painting. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, and, and, and thank you both for sharing your thoughts. It was an honor to have two great thinkers like you on this on stage, but I'm afraid our time is up. <laughs> and um, we'll be moving on to the next session. So, but thank you again.